Good morning, and thank you for joining the CEO Roundtable on Cancer and our delivery today, a message around the pandemic, but specifically addressing, addressing workplace health burdens, specifically related to oncology. So thank you for joining us here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and um, jump right into some housekeeping items, and then we'll go into some introductions, and then we'll get moving through our discussion. So um, quick, a couple of things on housekeeping. Uh, we have the call set up today as a meeting. So if you are looking forward to having you um, certainly be participatory and today you'll be able to place your questions for the panelists here in our chat box. Uh, if you want to, you can actually um, place them at Mary Liz Rich and that way I'll actually see them specifically and that way it won't be for the full audience. Today's meeting is being recorded so that we can actually place it onto our website for future reference and future tutorials as we continue to move forward with bettering our best around accreditation and building out um, work uh, workplace um, health cultures that are important to all patients. So again, thank you for joining us here today. A um, little bit about our audience as you guys are joining us. We have um, people from all different sectors. We have government, we have private, public health, um, we have um, public uh, uh, corporations, uh, we have small businesses, large businesses, college campuses, uh, health systems. So we gladly, gladly welcome you all. We have chief medical officers, health and talent, um, wellness professionals, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion, and just um, the, the employee itself and wanting to know more about health culture and how they can help create health cultures in their own communities and their own workplaces. So um, welcome to today. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Mary Elizabeth Rich. I serve as the CEO um, on CEO Roundtable on Cancer President. And today I am surrounded by um, just an incredible group of panelists uh, to share some meaningful information with you today. And we want this day to be a discussion, not just between um, my asking questions, we want the discussion to be between them as panelists. So Otis, Dr. Brawley, um, America's oncologist, um, I'm going to toss it over to you first to do a quick introduction. It doesn't have to be quick. You can, you know, you can take all the time you like, um, but um, we're going to um, have you introduce yourself and then we'll um, go around the robin. Uh, thank you. I'm Otis Brawley. I'm a, a medical oncologist and epidemiologist. I'm the uh, Bloomberg Professor of Oncology and Epidemiology at both the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And uh, I spend a lot of time looking at population health and looking at trends regarding cancer and other things as well. Uh, in a previous job, I was Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. And before that, I was Director of the Cancer Center at Emory University. Fantastic. Jen Mills, Dr. Jen Mills as well. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. What you need to know first is that I've been the president of the Otis Fan Club for quite some time, so really happy to be on a panel anytime that he is here um, and have really enjoyed getting to know Joya as well. Um, my background is in public health and social work. I started my oncology career at the Lymphoma Research Foundation and then transitioned to Genentech for eight years and have been with Foundation Medicine for about three, leading external partnerships. So really excited to be here and share some interesting insights. And also to Foundation Medicine is both an accredited gold standard company as well as a member of the CEO Roundtable. Uh, Johns Hopkins is also, Johns Hopkins Medicine is an accredited Gold Center Enterprise as well. So thank you again for all that you do to create cultures of health. Joya, I'm gonna introduce, ask you to introduce yourself now. Thanks, I'm Joya Delgado-Harris. I am Executive Director for CEO Cancer Gold Standard and also work very closely with our Going for Gold program with our HBCUs and Hispanic Serving Institutions. So really excited to be serving in this role. Relatively new to CEO Roundtable, been on board for about seven months and um, thrilled to be here in a previous role. I served, um, I worked at American Cancer Society, so worked under Dr. Brawley. It is a pleasure to be on this panel with him. He is more than, he's, he's a friend and he also will answer a call when I have a question. Um, about something. I am a, a very grateful, very grateful 14-year breast cancer survivor, stage 3C. So um, to work here 
is a, is a blessing and it's a privilege. And to be able to um, talk about this particular topic is, is very important because I went through breast cancer treatment with no pandemic. So I can only imagine the burdens that it's placing on patients today. And um, so when I say he answered my calls, when I had calls and concerns and scares, he would be there. So there's no amount of thanks I can give to him for that. So it's a pleasure to be here. That's true. Great, thank you for those great introductions. And Joya, thank you for that great lead-in question, which will kick us right over to Otis uh, to get us started on exactly what you just talked about in terms of prevention and patient and survivorship, in which we all know that he is extremely passionate about. Um, uh, Dr. Brawley, Otis also left, um, and um, not left, but actually led us through our own evaluation and retooling out our accreditation tool. And he also serves on our Health and Wellbeing Council for the CEO Roundtable on Cancer. And these have long been tenants of his um, on specific um, service to community and talking about prevention. And coming out of this pandemic, we want to continue saying coming out of this pandemic, Dr. Bali, how, how are ways that you feel the workplace can really shepherd in greater prevention and support of survivorship, knowing what we know the impact of the pandemic has had on early detection um, and treatment and the role that maybe the, the workplace can play? So I know you have a lot of background details on this, so you yeah. just take the question away and roll. Yeah, the, uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be able to talk about uh, health issues and promoting health. And while I'm a cancer doc, I want to promote all health. One of the problems sometimes is we so focus on one particular disease. People will be lung cancer advocates or prostate cancer advocates or breast cancer advocates, and they forget that there's not only a number of other cancers, but there are a number of other diseases. And when we talk about prevention, uh, some people prefer we call it risk reduction, and uh, it really is doing things to reduce risk of a number of cancers, as well as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and several other diseases. Even knee replacement surgery can be, you can reduce the risk for needing that. Um, we're talking about not smoking. We're talking about good diet balanced in calories, along with good exercise, and trying to reduce obesity. Um, many people are, are aware that obesity is a problem. I think of it as energy imbalance. It's consuming too many calories, not burning enough calories off, and then storing too many calories. The obesity part is the storing. And we've got data to show that Energy imbalance causes diabetes, it causes cardiovascular disease, and within the next several years, it will be the leading cause of cancer. Right now, it's the second leading cause of cancer with tobacco being first, but tobacco consumption rates are going down and obesity and energy imbalance is becoming more and more of a problem in our population. So when I'm talking about risk reduction and prevention, I'm very importantly talking about avoiding tobacco or people not who are smoking, stopping the smoke. By the way, I've got good data from the cardiovascular world that if someone smokes today and they stop smoking today, their risk of heart attack goes down six months from now. Your risk of cancer goes down five to 10 years from now, but if they stop smoking the day, there's a benefit six months from now. Uh, so we're talking about tobacco cessation, tobacco control. We're talking about energy imbalance issues, good diet, good exercise, trying to maintain an ideal body weight. Uh, that's the major prevention. Some of the prevention that we've lost during the last two years of the uh, pandemic involve, uh, interestingly enough, young boys and girls not getting HPV vaccination uh, or other vaccines. I'm especially interested in hepatitis B and HPV because they cause cancer. Human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer, not just head and neck cancer, but uh, four other additional cancers as well. Hepatitis B 
vaccine prevents liver cancer. Uh, in the in, you know worldwide, liver cancer is a huge problem, uh, less so in the United States, but among certain populations in the United States, especially people from Southeast Asia, it's a significant cause of death, even in the United States. And so this pandemic has made us focus so much on the infectious disease and not focus on other health issues. I'm even worried that people are starting to drink more alcohol. By the way, most people don't realize one in 20 cancers in the United States is caused by alcohol consumption. Alcohol is a carcinogen. And as we've stayed distanced from other people, uh, there's been more smoking, there's been more alcohol drinking. We, we need to get back to, uh, my mother used to say, get back to brass tacks, get back to basic principles and actually practice health promotion. And keep in mind, it's not just health promotion to prevent cancer. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about screening not being done over the last two years. And that is a concern, that is a problem. Uh, as we go longer, it becomes more of a concern. I wasn't really worried in the first six months because you know, a mammogram every two years in my clinical trials is as good as a mammogram every year. So if you delay it by three or four months, big deal. Uh, colonoscopy every 10 years, delay it, but no. But now as we've gone two years into this, those delays are starting to become more and more of a concern. Uh, keep in mind, the, the screening cancers, the cancers where we commonly screen are colon, cervix, breast, lung, prostate, and skin cancer. Those are the ones that we commonly screen for. Uh, and uh, I worry that we're getting so focused on the disease, which we need to focus on, that we're not focusing on all global health. Last thing I'll point out, and this has been a huge issue for me, I still take care of patients. We have patients who have dropped out of treatment because uh, our hospitals are filled to the brim with people with this respiratory illness. I've literally wanted to admit patients uh, to Johns Hopkins Hospital within the last four weeks. And I've been told, no, we don't have room. And we've been triaging people who would normally have been admitted to the hospital and telling them uh, in normal times, you'd be sick enough to be admitted for the hospital, but we're gonna have to do this one from home. And that's really unfortunate. And the only way we can get around this resource problem is if we do all the things that are necessary to control COVID. Now we're getting to a point where COVID seems to be waning, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing social distancing. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be encouraging people to stay up to date on their vaccines. I'm saying up to date because uh, we very well may be calling for people to get a fourth vaccine for people who've gotten the mRNA. Right now, they should get the initial two and a booster five to six months after the second. Uh, but we may very well uh, say six months after that booster, people are gonna need to get another vaccine. We need to try to keep people out of the hospital so people who are having strokes, heart attacks, having cancer can get into the hospital to get the care that they need. And indeed, this inability to take care of people who are sick with non-COVID conditions, uh, we're not keeping track of that. You know, over 850,000 have died from COVID, but there's a goodly number who have died, not from COVID, but because of COVID. I'll stop at that point. Excellent. You always provide just such amazing thought-provoking um, challenges that, one, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on that before I shift over to you, Jen, um, because I think there's a really component that the workplace can help to bring about um, some of these shifts. Um, and I've also heard you speak around the numbers of deaths 
related to, or I wouldn't say deaths, maybe the number of late stage diagnoses that will now be attributed to COVID. Um, can you maybe just touch on that a bit? Because I think that's really important, especially for our workplace. Sure. Uh, we have, um, it goes back to how a lot of cancers are diagnosed. Uh, in colorectal cancer, and I, I use this as an example because I, I know of it, uh, where this has actually happened. In colorectal cancer, uh, there's a certain number of people who will notice that there's blood in your bowel movements and go to the doctor and say, what's going on? And they will end up getting a colonoscopy and be diagnosed with a colon cancer. Hopefully, at that point, it's stage two. And uh, stage two... Uh, we can still have a very good outcome in 70 plus percent of stage twos. If it's stage three, we can still have a very good outcome in at least 55 percent of people with colorectal cancer. There are people who've had blood in their stool now for 18 months and have not come to see the doctor to get that life-saving diagnosis. Now, uh, during that 18 months, that tumor is growing and spreading. Uh, that's a colorectal cancer example. There, uh, I also know of people who uh, have missed their mammogram two years ago now and still have not gotten it. And when they get their mammogram, uh, they can have badness that has been going ongoing for two years. These are, these are the problems that we are concerned about. Uh, and if you can, uh, as employers, encourage people to start thinking about health, to include COVID, but beyond COVID, that, that is what I think is really important. The other important thing is, please do what you can to encourage people to get vaccinated for coronavirus. You know, we, we've got good epidemiology now to show that the coronavirus vaccine over the last year to 14 months that's been widely available has now prevented at least 200,000 deaths. Uh, by the way, I don't know of any intervention in medicine. I know of no drug that has, that you can say, prevented 200,000 deaths in one year in one country, other than the coronavirus vaccine. You know, it's amazing, it's so controversial, and, and it's, it's literally proven itself to be the best drug ever created. By the way, just 30 seconds, please keep in mind, the coronavirus vaccine was developed because of a large effort in terms of cancer research, infectious disease research, molecular biology over the last 50 years. Richard Nixon's war on cancer is directly related to the messenger RNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer. Invest in research, that's the message. Invest in research and you never know what the benefit is going to be. When Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act 50 years ago, he did not envision that he was going to end up helping to cause the creation of a vaccine that would prevent 200,000 deaths in one year. That's amazing. Yes, thank you. So Jen, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to you and tie in to what um, Otis was just sharing around um, workplace uh, messaging within the workplace. And if you could please share a bit there how foundation medicine, one has addressed the pandemic, but also just created that culture of health around your, um, around foundation medicine. And I know that you'll tie into some of the gold standard component, but let's just reform it, roll. Yeah, maybe before I comment on some of our practical interventions, I'll just maybe reflect on Otis's comments around um, how people think about screening and prevention in a normal state compared to in a COVID state. And I've often said in all of my social work training, the only theory you need to know about human behavior is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if we think of a typical environment without COVID, screening probably and prevention probably fall somewhere in the middle, but certainly are above and dependent on that sense of safety and security at the base. When you introduce a pandemic, 
And facts like people are caring for elderly parents and their kids at home, potentially sick, while trying to maybe start a new job and tackle all of the other stressors of life. Screening prevention, general health and well being, energy ba balance, as Otis described it, become more of a category of self actualization and something that sometimes feels unattainable to people. And I think many employers during the pandemic have realized that cumulative burden that employees were facing on a day-to-day -day basis and early on started um, it, testing out and trying new strategies to support individuals. Um, you've seen a lot of wellness programs, get up and move, you know, stretch and move, support Um, we really are challenged to make sure that we are creating um, the, the connections that people need to the services that can help them um, create a whole sense of well-being, not just about um, their current state or their job or one aspect of their health. So a couple of things that we've done um, internally, certainly increasing the awareness of our employee assistance programs and the health benefits and the services that are there. We recognize that people perhaps didn't even know the resources that were available to them. So I know many companies have done that, but really just articulating and making it super simple for people to access resources. We also noticed early on that some of the biggest burdens were the, the, the family-based burdens and thinking about individual employees, but also all the people in their ecosystem. So we put in additional health counselors, additional networking groups, additional resources to support people. I think long-term, we're going to see companies shift towards more flexible work environments and ways that people can take time off. If you're an hourly employee in a lab, you have a very different experience than if you're a senior executive in a company as to how you can control your day and, and be able to do the prevention-based efforts that are essential to your health, as well as seek your screenings, right? When do you make an appointment for a mammogram if you're working all day? Um, and how do we as employers think about those? So for us at Foundation Medicine, I also wanted to um, build on Otis's comments about thinking of the different experiences of people in the workplace. And we're a cancer-based company. We're a molecular information company, including being a lab that helps patients and physicians find answers and take action when they're in those really critical moments and trying to understand what their treatment options are. With that, we do attract a lot of cancer survivors or people who've been impacted by cancer to our employee base of now 1,800 people um, across the US and Germany. And we think of the experiences of survivors and the secondary prevention and the secondary screenings and just the role of survivorship there and making sure that patients um, and survivors that are in our network have access to the latest and greatest. So in the gold standards, I'm sure you all know, but survivorship is one of those key aspects. So I would challenge us as an employee network of committed supporters of people with cancer, how we think about looking at our benefits and the resources that we have for people impacted by cancer and how we can support them in COVID. I'll give you one example and then maybe I'll pass it off to Joya or open it up for comment. Um, I have a woman on my team who speaks very publicly about her breast cancer experience and really thinking about her day-to-day um, -day experience of juggling kids, trying to maintain all of the rigor in her schedule of follow-up survivorship care, in addition to just starting a new job with my team yeah, it all broader employers have a responsibility to think about supporting those people as well as the general public who perhaps haven't been impacted by cancer and we hope that they are great so joy she kind of went ahead and volleyed over to you um maybe if you could one i think um Otis brought out some things specifically around tobacco, um, tobacco cessation. Maybe you can kind of kick us off with just familiarizing, making sure everyone here just reminded of what we've been working on over the past, um, you know, 12 months um, with our reaccreditation, but also drawing out some of those components around that prevention um, and tobacco and survivorship piece. Thanks. So the benefit of being here for seven months, it's I know the new, the new refreshed gold standard application. Um, and I have to give lots of credit to Therese Martin, our senior manager of Gold, uh, Gold Standard, and to you, Mary Liz, and the whole team and the Health and Wellbeing Council for making it what it is now and in suggesting the changes that we've implemented and incorporated. Um, 
So it looks great to me. And I think it was great before, but it's nice that we've been able to amend it a bit to really factor in um, placing more emphasis on health education and navigation overall. And I love what Dr. Brawley said about, yes, we are an oncology organization, but so many other conditions um, are part of our overall health. So we can't, we have to, we can't do it in a vacuum. So um, to that point, looking at health education and navigation, our pillars were adjusted a bit. For example, pillar three is, um, that is, well, let me just start from the first. Our first pillar um, is health education and navigation. The second pillar is prevention and early detection. Third pillar is advancing treatment. Survivorship is our fourth pillar and well-being is our fifth pillar. And it's nice because those first, the first and fifth pillars are our bookends. They are looking at health overall. Health education navigation is applicable to everything. And then well-being is as well. Um, the three book, the three um, pillars in the middle are oncology focused. So um, pillar three um, was adjusted um, to expand beyond clinical trials and include criteria such as biomarker and genetic testing, genomic testing. So that's very important. It's really helping patients um, be their own best advocates. And then pillar five, um, while being is so much more than physical health, as we all know, and as, as Dr. Mills just mentioned, it is, um, it is financial health, it's environmental health, it's emotional and mental health. So that's, those are critical, so critical to a cancer patient and their family um, and their journey. So um, and throughout all of our pillars and everything we do is emphasis on diversity and health equity and inclusion. So um, really looking at the framework to make sure that it's as comprehensive as possible and, um, and, and helping patients to be their own best advocate. I take myself off mute. Uh, could you touch on uh, the tobacco cessation piece? Um, I know that Dr. Brawley said that, you know, tobacco um, is on the decline. However, in some ways it's on the increase, especially among youth. Um, there are some components there. So could you talk a little bit about tobacco cessation, Joya, um, embedded within our framework? Are you asking me to contradict Dr. Brawley? Of course, yes, because that's what keeps the conversation flowing. That's okay. the whole point. <laughs> Dr. Brawley, my boss, what do I do? Yeah. If, we, if we have agreement, then we have silence. If we no. have challenging, then we have discussion. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, of course, tobacco cessation is a big thing um, for us and for the gold standard. And we want to make sure that we are covering um, that aspect and the, and the truth that, that tobacco is, is, um, is not, is, is, will, will, will increase people's risk. Um, so we want to make sure that's, that's handled. So it's a big part of the gold standard. Um, and but I also think flexibility, right? I mean, so, so much oh, flexibility sure. that has been, that has been afforded the employee to be able to work from home. They're working in different environments that don't really constrict, um, you know, not being able to access tobacco during the day. Now they can sit at their desk at home and, um, you know, if they right. want to have a cigarette, they can. Um, and lots of stress, right? Lots of stress with COVID and just being the isolation alone. So Otis, I know you want to talk because I can tell it's coming. Yeah, let me tie this all together. Take Joy off the bucket. Thank you. Uh, in 1955, and this is easy to remember for an old man like me. In 1955, 55% of adult males smoke cigarettes. In 1965, 35% of adult females in the United States smoke cigarettes. Those were the highs. And there's been a decline ever since 1955 in men, ever since 1965 in women. We're now around 17% of men and maybe 14% of women smoke cigarettes. And as we've had that decline, there, about 30 years later, as the decline started in 80 and 55 in smoking, the decline in deaths from lung cancer started in 1990. 35 years later or so. Uh, and so that's why we've got much of our decline in mortalities because smoking started going down. Now, smoking went down, as Mary Liz said, partially because of things that we did to discourage smoking, made it very expensive to buy a pack of cigarettes with excise taxes, made it very hard to find a place to smoke. 
can't smoke in bars anymore, can't smoke in restaurants anymore. Indeed, now it's, a, it's amazing. We have a generation of people who are shocked that there used to be a smoking section at almost every restaurant. Okay, so these were the things that were done to control smoking. Now, everybody's staying at home. Many of us are working from home and we're a little bored uh, maybe free to smoke a little bit more. So we're worried that over the last two years, there's been some slight increases in smoking because of the way we changed our living. We're also very much worried, by the way, about electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes, uh, especially among children. Um, by the way, very few Americans start smoking cigarettes after the age of 18. Most people start smoking at about the age of 15 for cigarettes and e-cigarettes. We've got some data about junior high school use of e-cigarettes. The problem with e-cigarettes is uh, one's child can go up in one's room and, and smoke the e-cigarette. You'll never smell the residue. So we do have to worry about these sorts of things. We need to provide uh, adequate counseling not to start smoking, and adequate counseling on what one can do to get off of smoking. And I'll end by noting that nicotine in cigarettes is more addictive a drug than is cocaine. That's a mic dropper there. So, Jen, we're glad you're back. Um, even though your acrobatics were fantastic, I, must say, I, mean, I was very yeah. impressed. Well, as I was trying to get my hotspot to work, we're having crazy storms here in the Northeast and sleet and really weird weather. And I lost internet in the midst. So <laughs> I don't know how I got turned upside down, but that was entertaining. Well, I'm thinking maybe, I think Otis actually thought at one point he was upside down because he kind of looked like this. Said, Wait a second, is it me? <laughs> Fun with Zoom. <laughs> so while you were away, a question yes. came in for you, Jen. Um, so, and I think from, from the workplace too, which I mean, Otis, don't forget you're in a workplace too. So I mean, you know, the environment that you're in and, and higher education and health system, um, I think you could really both answer this. I'd like for you both to answer this. Does remote work make it easier or harder for employers? And, and Otis, you kind of were just talking about this, but does remote work make it easier or harder for employers to encourage health for employees or present new opportunities? Give me some examples. I think, yeah, I think what I hear from most of my colleagues and people across the organization is it's tougher um, in a lot of ways. One, the, the flow of information, you're really reliant on virtual meetings as opposed to in-person seminars where people could come in and really be focused and get the messages, ask questions in a way that um, includes human like live contact, which often makes things sink in more. Um, we also know that the way the pandemic is evolving, people's experiences now are very different than when they started. So you're sort of reaching this place where people are settling into their new norm, if you will, which may or may not be healthier than, um, than where they were previously. Certainly the amount of sitting that we're all doing um, and, and the lack of movement that perhaps is, has been part of one's day um, has certainly been commented on. In terms of sharing information, I think companies, including ours, have gotten really creative about ways to do it in really succinct nuggets and to host topic-specific sessions and um, and do a make a really concerted push to make sure that employees do know what the benefits are um, that are available to them, new programs that were put in place, et cetera. Um, it will be interesting to see, to Otis's earlier point, um, how two years from now the impact of this plays out in terms of in terms of health, and I think that's what we all collectively worry about. Yeah, you know, in answer to the question, Mary Liz, uh, you know, I I I'm at a university that is uh, what about twenty four thousand students and uh, another forty thousand employees. Our gyms closed down for a time, so people who came to work. And, one, and hit, part of the routine was the exercise while at work, before, after work, that became harder. 
Uh, I know people who uh, always go to the salad bar at lunchtime because it's easier to assemble a salad there than at their home. Uh, so they closed down the salad bar. Uh, and so we, people's eating started getting in the comfort food and that sort of thing. Now, there are a few people I know who uh, use the opportunity, uh, not commuting and that sort of stuff to exercise at home. And there's few people who actually did benefit from it, but many people, alcohol consumption increased, bad diet increased, exercise went down. And, you know, we've already talked about those people I really worry about who started smoking. Uh, there, there's, uh, this has not been good. And I do think that uh, uh, businesses and employers can do something, not to scold people, but to encourage healthy habits, or at least encourage people to start thinking about healthy habits and to try to take those healthy habits home to the rest of their family. Well, and perhaps it's an opportunity for companies to look at their benefit utilization and really do a reflection on things like mental health, um, you know, coverage and substance abuse support and some of these things that employers can play a really big role in the way that they design the insurance programs that are available to their employees. I know um, many companies, including us, are doing that look back now into 2021 to, to say, what can we do better to support employees and, and at least decreasing some of the burdens that might exist from a financial or reimbursement perspective. So that was actually was, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Someone was asking, is anyone tracking this? And I, I, the Centers for Disease Control uh, actually has several surveys that they do every three or four months uh, that look at behaviors, look at smoking, look at exercise. Uh, the other, that one looks at behaviors in terms of disease, like smoking, eating, exercise, obesity, and that sort of thing. Another looks at activities such as screening uh, and going to the doctor. So we, we will get this data on a national basis. Well, and the gold, the gold standard is linked in with the CDC as well. Um, so, Joy, I'm gonna, Joy, you were getting ready to talk, but I was also getting ready to ask you a question that just came in. Uh, so, go ahead, but mention whatever you were going to say. I think I was just going to piggyback off of what Dr. Brawley said about employees and coming to work in their routines that may have been disrupted. And similarly, I'm thinking about our college campuses and our university partners, and as they are um, going through their accreditation, they're also simultaneously looking at going for gold or or activities that they can implement on their campus. And a lot of things we've talked about so far, we're still in the beginning phases of, of figuring out how that's gonna look on each campus and it will look different on each campus by design, by virtue of the fact that everyone has different resources, opportunities. But one of the things we talk about are, um, you know, having incentives for students to, to go to the, you know, fitness center more often or, or having um, maybe gold standard stickers, if you will, however that will look. Um, in, in the cafeteria, if you're going to make, you know, having one around the salad bar or a vegetable choice or something that's, that's a healthier option. So different things, and most colleges are not thinking about cancer, but they can be thinking about risk reduction activities. And um, those are the types of things we'd like to start planting and helping them um, really, you know, figure out. So that goes back to really the question that was also being asked from a company that's considering accreditation that's not currently accredited. And they were asking if there were resources um, within our framework that can help them address their workplace cancer burden. Um, I know we probably can't spell all that out here, but if you could just kind of highlight a little bit of that joy, that'd be great. Yeah, if, if I'm answering the question correctly, there are lots of resources within the application. Um, I mentioned Therese Martin before, but Therese and, and team did a great job of having, um, a, with each question, having a library, if you will, of resources. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm pointing to the drop down menu. Um, but um, if you click on it next to the question, there's a list of, of operations. You've been virtually, you've been virtually trained now. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> it's here. Yeah. <laughs> If you click here, you'll have a list of um, drop down um, of a drop down menu that will give a list of really great resources. And of course, we're always we're always here to help answer questions that are that you know might not be there. But I think there's a there's almost there's a lot of resources. 
good stuff. Well, and it also identifies the gaps, right? If they have gaps in their um, health and well being or in their wellness packaging for their company, it can easily identify those gaps that they can then address um, more specifically versus needing to figure out where are their gaps. 100%. Um, you made me think about, I have a, a dear friend, Libra Clements, who's chief diversity officer at, at a company called Twilio. And she wrote a piece recently that um, she was talking about ways to help, you know, with your organization and, and metrics. And one of the things she says, use data to move, not prove. And that kind of resonated because it's catchy, but it's also true. Data is fantastic. We have to have it. And it does, you know, we are proving certain things, but we're also helps us move toward that place we want to be. And so that's what the gold standard does. It provides a tool to help companies, schools um, know where they stand and know what opportunities exist and move toward a place and be constantly evolving because, you know, things change. We need to, we need to, you know, correct. So, um, you know, knowing where you stand and, and that gold standard application can really help um, determine some of those opportunities. And maybe building on that joy, it also helps identify how to think about the holistic cancer experience from early, you know, prevention, early screening to supporting those people by cancer and can identify gaps that perhaps hadn't been thought about. The clinical trial access piece is one that I keep hearkening back to because I do think employers, particularly healthcare employers, um, have a responsibility to look at those benefits and make sure that people that want to participate in clinical trials are supported to do that. So that's just one example of where I think the um, methodology of the pillars and the application process itself can um, catalyze some of those conversations about areas that you perhaps just assumed were covered in your benefits or were being supported by employee assistance um, conversations, but maybe aren't explicitly. So we, um, we, we structured these calls to be um, really, we blocked them for an hour, but we target 45 minutes, which means we have some time for some Q&A now, and we've kind of been fluttering them in. But I'm going to put Dr. Brawley on the spot. This is a great thing about how we work these panels. They have no idea what kind of questions we're going to ask which also means you can tell me, no, I cannot answer that. Um, so you, it's freedom of choice. Um, we will certainly make that available to you, um, Dr. Brawley, on this one. But we're asking this question of you from a physician perspective. Um, and what role, it's a two-part question, what role do you believe health systems have in addressing the cancer burden alongside the community be it yeah. corporate community, academic community, et cetera? Yeah, uh, this is, it's an easy question for me because it's one that I uh, think about a lot and I'm a little outspoken on. Uh, the health community in the United States is very focused on diagnosis and treatment of disease. Uh, there is minimal focus on prevention or risk reduction, with a few exceptions. Uh, cholesterol and, and hypertension are measured and treated with the idea of preventing cardiovascular disease and hypertension also uh, prevents, the treatment of hypertension prevents kidney disease. Uh, we spend a little bit of effort on trying to treat people who are smokers to help them stop smoking, help them uh, cure their addiction. But we don't spend a lot of time, and we should spend more on what I call teaching people how to be healthy, teaching good health behaviors. Uh, Mary Liz, this is actually a strong point for you and, and your organization. Um, and you know, I was talking to a, uh, a strategic planner for a large health system in the Midwest yesterday about this very issue. And uh, she kind of jokingly said, and I, both of us realized it's not really a joke. You know, I was saying we don't teach enough health behaviors. We're too much into diet, screen, diagnose, and treat. And she says, yes, but screen, diagnose, and treat is 18% of our GDP. That's very true. You know, how do we monetize prevention of disease or risk reduction of disease? 
And, uh, and I don't want to go too long, but you know, some of the things on the board are pretty bad right now. We talked about uh, energy imbalance and obesity is just one part of that energy imbalance. Keep in mind, 15% uh, of Americans were obese in 1970, and today it's nearly 40%. For certain subgroups, for Black women, it's 70%. You know, so so we're, that's one of the reasons why energy imbalance will, within the next several leading cause of cancer in the United States surpassing tobacco. But we need to focus on healthy living and the questioner is absolutely correct. Uh, our organizations that treat the hospitals and the doctors and the clinics fall down in this arena. Which means that the employer, the workplace is pivotal in that prevention portion and the education around prevention, the screenings, um, the early education piece, which really flows back in, as you said, the gold standard accreditation helps to deliver for um, the workplaces that are accredited some resources that can help them support their employees. Yes, and Mary Liz, to the, to the point, many of the people in the audience realize that they're spending somewhere between uh, 19 and $20,000 a year for the average healthcare plan for a, a family, for each employee, uh, we have data to show that uh, prevention or risk reduction actually lowers costs. Absolutely. All right, um, before we um, close out, uh, I want to ask the panelists, is there anything that we didn't um, maybe there are lots of things we didn't talk about today, but is there something that you would like to leave the audience with here today? Um, and Joy, I'll ask you to specifically talk about how, how if they are more wanting to learn more about accreditation to do so. So that's you know, your, I'm going to plant that seed with you, but um, we'll go, uh, let's say Jen first. I would say think about the best way to get an honest pulse from where your employees are today and where you want them to be from a health and whole um, being perspective and how you can help them get there and specifically think about people that have already been impacted by cancer and, the, and those that haven't yet and what you can do differently. Otis? Uh, I'm gonna come out of left field. Uh, Excellent, that's oh, all right. As, as as the pandemic becomes endemic, we're going to have COVID weaning and then rising again and then going down. One thing that we're all gonna to have to worry about as employers is we have some employees who are immunosuppressed. These may be people who have leukemia and lymphoma. These may be people who are being treated with immunosuppressive agents, many of whom are advertised on TV now for psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, about 4% of Americans are immunosuppressed. We as employers are going to have to worry about these people. It is a disability, and we're going to have to try to protect these people. Uh, and so it's up to us to encourage uh, our employees to look out for the other employees by getting vaccinated. So you don't give the disease to someone who's immunosuppressed. Uh, maintaining some social distances and some various practices to prevent spread of the disease. So we're going to have to encourage those sorts of while we don't get off the message of encouraging our employees to be healthy in general. Excellent. Joya? Yeah, I didn't expect that question. I probably should have, but um, it made me get a little, not emotional, but just a little, took me back to 2007 when I was diagnosed. And I think if I can just share that, um, what was so helpful to me as a patient going through it, it was just to have the compassion, if you will, from my employer and, um, and understanding that, um, that I was going through something life-changing. And so it, it just helps employees feel valued and that, that their situation is important. And so I think that's one of the single most things that an employer can do 
is, is, is display that, demonstrate that, um, which is actually what an employer being gold standard accredited is doing. It's showing that we care about our workforce. So um, that's important um, for sure. Not profound, but important and made me think about that when you asked the question. Um, but in terms of um, how a company, um, a campus, anyone can can find out more about accreditation, I would put the um, I'll put it in the chat box, but it's um, coming to our website. It's a long one, but um, it's application.cancergoldstandard.org. And I'll just throw it in the chat box as well. But um, please read, go there and look for more information. And we can certainly um, be happy to call and, and or take a call and listen to questions and happy to answer anything. And begin their journey with a healthy, um, a health culture that everyone um, can embrace, right? And uh, as you were talking about too, not just looking out for your fellow employees, but that's one of the key components for the accreditation or for our tenants of gold standard, and that is personal health. And knowing your own personal health advocate, your own personal health, and being able to advocate for your own personal health within your employer um, is critically important for everyone to feel confident and um, be able to um, address their, um, their, their scenarios within their workplace and it be heard. So we thank all of you today for um, participating with us. We specifically thank our panelists and sharing their expertise um, in addressing what um, we here at the CEO Roundtable is our mission to eliminate the burdens of cancer um, the best we can based on the profound research uh, that is being done and is always evolving. So we thank you. Um, we wish you the best of weekends and we look forward to hearing from you soon.